Hello everyone, this is PaleoNerd here with the final video in my scientific analysis of Jurassic Fight Club. Now that I have analyzed each individual episode, I'm going to go over the series as a whole, covering the inaccuracies which are consistent throughout the entire series, and essentially explaining how Jurassic Fight Club fails as a documentary. If you somehow haven't already, please watch the rest of my analysis videos on this show first so you can watch my decreasing tolerance of this show's bullshit. Since I'm going to go through a lot of inaccuracies shared by many other documentaries, this will probably be the first and only time I will do a series-wide analysis. We'll be starting off this video with one of the two main inaccuracies that are consistent throughout nearly the entire series. Feathers on dromaeosaurs, or more accurately, the lack thereof. Three separate dromaeosaurs are featured in the series, and although two of them do possess some feathers, it's nowhere near the amount that real scientists think dromaeosaurs had. And feathers on dromaeosaurs is not a new idea. Ever since John Ostrom noticed the similarities between Deinonychus and Archaeopteryx back in the 60s, Scientists have suggested that Deinonychus and other similar theropods may have had feathers, and fossils of dromaeosaurs like Cynornithosaurus and Microraptor with preserved feather impressions have been known since 1999, so the they didn't know at the time defense doesn't really work here. Supposedly, the main reason for the show's decision to exclude feathers is due to the show's budget, they they, the modelers couldn't afford to give the dromaeosaurs feathers without making them look bad, and judging by how well they handled fur and Ice Age monsters and the pycnofibers on the pterosaurs and raptors last stand, I'm inclined to believe them. Still, I personally think they should have gone with feathers regardless, and I think this is pretty much just a thinly veiled excuse to try and make the dinosaurs as scary as possible. Think, if this explanation really held as much water as some people think, then why do the American lion and short-faced bear still have fur, or why do the pterosaurs still have pycnofibers, if it looks so terrible? And believe me, it does. If they're willing to remove feathers from dinosaurs to save money, why not do the same for the mammals and the pterosaurs? Yes, it would be inaccurate and probably terrifying to show a hairless lion and bear fighting each other, but the point I'm making here is that the exact same is true for the dinosaurs. It is equally inaccurate for the show to have dromaeosaurs with few or no feathers as it is to do the same for a lion or a bear or a pterosaur. And if I had to choose between naked dromaeosaurs or feathers that don't quite look right, I'd still pick the feathers. It's called picking your battles, something that this show ironically fails at, seeing as it's usually all about fights. How about the execution of the two dromaeosaurids they actually put the feathers on? Well, it's awful. <laughs> Utahraptor only has feathers on the back of the neck and its arms, while Acroraptor has them on the head, arms, and the tail. Ooh, different. As I've established plenty of times before, Dromaeosaurids looked more like birds than the lizards with feathers glued on them that this show tries to pass off as dinosaurs. And other better documentaries have been able to do exactly what Jurassic Fight Club claimed to not be able to do. Take, for example, the documentary film When Dinosaurs Roamed America, a legitimately great documentary that made history by being the first major film production to feature feathered dinosaurs, all the way back in 2001, over seven years before Jurassic Fight Club, and it still does feathers better than that abomination does. Sure, the feather covering on the dromaeosaurs featured in the documentary aren't great, as they basically look like the Jurassic Park raptors got tarred and feathered. Still, this is a genuinely great documentary, and its flaws are for the most part a product of its time. 
The same cannot be said for Jurassic Fight Club, which, again, handled feathers much worse than a documentary that came out about seven years ago with half the CGI capabilities and likely a lower budget. Again, this is not an attack on when dinosaurs roamed America. That's great. It's an attack on Jurassic Fight Club for not improving on the feathered dinosaurs of its predecessors and instead just spitting in their face. Because it's dark and edgy and shit. When Dinosaurs Roamed America tried to be as accurate as possible when it came to depicting feathered dinosaurs with the technology available at the time. While Jurassic Fight Club started out with a completely naked dromaeosaur and then just progressively added little bits of feathers to basically just say, There, they have feathers. Will you stop whiting now and love our show so we don't get cancelled? Well, no, I won't. No, I won't. And yes, you still got cancelled. So, we've established that not only is Jurassic Fight Club's excuse for not having feathers dumb, and we have also pointed out that another documentary that came out almost a decade prior was able to handle feathers much better. But we've also established that neither documentaries have portrayed feathers in a way that is consistent with today's perception of dromaeosaurids. So how feathered were dromaeosaurs? Well, the answer is pretty simple. They were pretty much as feathered as most birds are today. Again, it's really best to just compare dromaeosaurs to birds in regard to what they looked like and how they probably behaved. With this in mind, and based off actual discoveries of dromaeosaurids with feathers, I think it's safe to say that all dromaeosaurids were almost completely feathered, with the exception of the feet and the tip of the snout, with some variation depending on the species. They also didn't just have simple downy feathers either, as adults would have had feathers almost as complex as the feathers of modern birds. Dromaeosaurs also likely all possessed tail fans and wings on their arms, the feathers of which connect to the second finger of the hand. The wings likely weren't used to fly for most dromaeosaurs, although the smaller ones would have been able to glide, but for the larger ones, the wings were likely used to steer themselves while running like modern ostriches do, as well as to incubate their eggs. So yeah, I think we have rather thoroughly dissected exactly what Jurassic Fight Club gets wrong about feathers. So let's move on to the next major inaccuracy, which is probably tied with this as the worst offender throughout the entire show's run. Theropods having pronated wrists. I have mentioned this in every episode that features a non-avian theropod, which by my count is about 10. For those of you who might not know what pronated wrists are, do your best impersonation of a dinosaur, preferably a theropod like T-Rex. If, if your palms are facing downwards, then you are pronating your wrists or based on what I got from the Google search, rotating the wrist in a palms down position. This position of the wrists is consistent with depictions of dinosaurs, not only in films and documentaries, but in art as well. From what I've researched, this view mainly comes from when scientists were first trying to figure out what dinosaurs looked like. Since many dinosaurs at this point showed signs that they were bipeds, they were compared to bipeds that live today, like humans and kangaroos. This not only led to the idea that dinosaurs drag their tails everywhere, but also that the hands of dinosaurs face downwards. However, subsequent studies of the structure of the wrists of theropod dinosaurs have shown that they were not capable of the complex movements required for the hands to face palms down. Instead, the wrists of theropods were in a neutral position, in which the palms face inward. If you're still pretending to be a dinosaur, now prepare to clap your hands, whether you're happy or you're not. But before you clap your hands, don't. Look at how your hands are positioned. That's what the arms of a theropod dinosaur would look like, more or less. They're almost about to clap, but they don't. Such tragic animals. 
So now, the next time you pretend to be a dinosaur, you can try that new method to properly supinate your hands so you can now look slightly more like a dinosaur, while your parents probably watch from a safe distance wondering what the hell went wrong when they were raising you. Of course, theropods could still move the wrists inward and upward, but most couldn't pronate them like portrayed in this show and many other films and documentaries, as doing so would actually break their wrists. I think there are some exceptions, like the Megaropteran Australovenator might have actually been able to pronate its wrists a bit, but I'm not entirely sure of that, so if I'm wrong about that, please let me know in the comments. Thankfully, the presence of pronated hands in theropods that couldn't do so in media has decreased lately, albeit very slowly. But hey, it is nice that documentaries are finally getting dinosaur wrists right, even though most movies have yet to catch up. And while this show is not one of the documentaries to leap forward, instead sticking with the status quo, it definitely might have inspired future documentaries to not repeat the same mistakes as before just because that's how we used to do things. Speaking of inaccuracies that are starting to die out, Jurassic Fight Club also seems to have a consistent problem with shrink wrapping its animals. Basically, they just looked at the skeleton and then just put skin over it so that the animal looks like it has severe anorexia. In severe cases, you can even see the animal's bones under their skin. No modern animals look like this unless they're starving to death, so prehistoric ones probably didn't either. This time, shrink wrapping in Jurassic Fight Club is not fully specific to the dinosaurs, as even the short-faced bear and the American lion seem a bit short on muscles and fur. Pretty much the only animal in the entire series that doesn't suffer from this problem is Brigma Fisetter. Every other animal you can practically see their ribs and even the holes in their skull. The solution is rather simple, just add more muscle, especially on the skulls where you shouldn't be able to see like the all the fenestrae and stuff. Many paleo artists have recently started to drift away from the trope of shrink wrapping prehistoric animals, and the book All Yesterdays, which I greatly recommend to anyone watching this video, even provided some reconstructions of modern animals based on how we commonly depict dinosaurs, turning ordinary animals like swans, rhinos, and baboons into terrifying monsters that look like they belong in a horror movie. This is really a topic for a later video, and we have a lot more serious inaccuracies to get to, but just remember that Jurassic Fight Club's animals are in desperate need of more meat on their bones. A sandwich or two might also help, but, you know. This next part will probably ruin quite a lot of childhoods, but it does need to be said. Dinosaurs did not roar. Put down your pitchforks, I have not gone mad, and I can prove it. While roaring is commonly associated with large predators like lions and tigers, Roaring is actually present in all sorts of creatures, as animals like big cats, gorillas, elephants, bovids, holler monkeys, bears, red deer, some seals, and hammerhead bats possess the ability to roar or make roar-like vocalizations. Notice what is the same with all those animals I listed. Yes, they are all mammals. While large mammals of today might at first seem like a good basis for dinosaurs, especially theropods, the best place to look is actually to their closest living relatives, birds and crocodilians. Mammals can roar because of a specialized larynx and hyoid bone, while birds use a syrinx to vocalize. However, we know that non-avian dinosaurs probably didn't possess a syrinx, as while birds have been found with fossilized syrinxes, non-avian dinosaurs have never been found with a syrinx. 
meaning the closest animals we can use as comparison when determining the sounds of dinosaurs or crocodilians like crocodiles and alligators. These animals occasionally communicate with sound, forcing air through their esophagus to make bellowing and hissing noises. As such, crocodiles and alligators are really the best animals to base dinosaur noises off of, rather than mammals, although some bird vocalizations can be used as well. That doesn't mean that dinosaurs chirped like birds, at least not the large ones likely, since many birds can make surprisingly deep noises. For example, male ostriches can often, can often make a loud noise that sounds like a lion's roar, and the Eurasian patern also makes some surprisingly deep noises. Even with that in mind, it is unlikely that real non-avian dinosaurs were as loud as they are portrayed in Jurassic Fight Club, where practically every goddamn second at least one dinosaur is roaring at the top of their lungs. Which brings me to my next point. No animal that lives today makes nearly as much noise as the animals do in this show. This is especially sinful for the predators who, definite, who would definitely not be making super loud noises because that would scare off their prey. Ever heard of the element of surprise? Yeah, turns out that's pretty important when trying to hunt your prey. Not to mention the dinosaurs would probably have one hell of a sore throat from roaring so much. Now we're on to one of the most annoying trends in this entire series. It's too awesome bro. In case anyone here is unfamiliar, awesome bro refers to the view of dinosaurs as nothing more than just giant movie monsters that go around killing everything. And that's pretty much on board with the show, as in every single episode, the carnivores are portrayed as insatiable, bloodthirsty monsters, while the herbivores are usually portrayed as nothing more than cannon fodder that serve to be killed by the much cooler carnivores. There are some exceptions to this, as both Bloodiest Battle and Raptor's Last Stand have the herbivores beat the carnivores, but every other carnivore versus herbivore fight, like Gang Killers, River of Death, and Raptors vs. T-Rex, have the predators reign victorious. First, the carnivores. The carnivores in this show, whether they're a dinosaur, shark, whale, bear, or lion, are always depicted just wandering around looking for a fight, and one recurring theme I've noticed throughout the series is that the narrator repeatedly states that predators had endless appetites and were constantly hunting for food. This is completely ridiculous, as most modern predators today spend very little of their day hunting and extinct predators were likely no different. Chances are, most theropods and other prehistoric predators depicted in this show spent most of their time sleeping, patrolling their territory, and trying to get laid. The show's tendency to have carnivores constantly hungry also leads to another common problem, which is that most of the predators in the show are complete idiots that absolutely refuse to leave even when faced with a situation they clearly cannot win. This includes the Nano Tyrannus and T-Rex hunter that tried to fight an adult female Tyrannosaurus after just trying to kill her children, the Deinonychus and gang killers that risk most of their pack for one Tyrannosaurus, the Allosaurus and Bloodiest Battle that just let themselves be killed by the Stegosaurus and Camarasaurus, the male Ceratosaurus and Hunter Becomes Hunted that refuses to run when, when confronted with a much larger Allosaurus, the Utah Raptor and Raptor's Last Stand that tried to kill what's essentially a dino pincushion, the American Lion from Ice Age Monsters that refused to abandon this kill when confronted by a much larger and stronger short-faced bear, and the Acro Raptor from Raptors vs. T-Rex that risked their lives to kill a gigantic Edmontosaurus merely because the Alpha was pissed that the Edmontosaurus was trespassing. On the other side of the spectrum, the herbivores are typically portrayed as gigantic wimps that just let the carnivores kill them. This is especially the case for Tenontosaurus and Edmontosaurus, as well as Pachyrhinosaurus, although Gastonia, Stegosaurus, and Camarasaurus are exceptions to this. 
as they actually do succeed at defeating the carnivore in their respective episodes. I've already talked about how poorly Tenontosaurus and Edmontosaurus are treated in this series. However, the sites that their episodes are based on already indicated that they probably lost the fight. So the problem isn't that these herbivores lose, but rather how they lose. Having such large and intimidating dinosaurs like Tenontosaurus and Edmontosaurus be killed by tiny little theropods like Deinonychus and Acroraptor is unrealistic and insulting. At least when Pachyrhinosaurus lost, it was against a larger theropod that could reasonably beat it in a fight. Now the final topic I want to cover in the analysis portion. The show often goes overboard with its speculation and it even seems to deliberately misinform people sometimes. As I've said before, speculation is a necessity when making a dinosaur documentary, but the problem with Jurassic Fight Club's speculation is that it is very often over the top or based on completely unrelated animals. Examples of this include Tyrannosaurus infecting its prey with bacteria, large theropods marking their territory with scent glands, Pachyrhinosaurus possessing a horn made of keratin, and Dromaeosaurus using complex hunting strategies, including communicating with hand motions and mimicking the sounds of other dinosaurs to confuse their prey. The other problem with this is that very rarely are these speculative behaviors identified as speculation, and the narrator often straight up lies about some of them, claiming that scientists know for a fact that they're true. As I said before, presenting speculation as fact only works in a documentary like Walking with Dinosaurs, as doing otherwise would interfere with the premise that the dinosaurs are actually being filmed. But with a documentary like Jurassic Fight Club, which has talking heads sprinkled throughout, it's really for the best to clarify what parts of your depictions are based on fossil evidence and what is mere speculation. If you've been paying attention to all my analysis videos on this series, you're likely well aware that Jurassic Fight Club is very misinformative at times. Although whether or not these errors are intentional is difficult to say, but I wouldn't put it above history to do something like that. That being said, a lot of inaccuracies were already inaccurate when the show was being made, meaning they very well could have been deliberate. Possible examples of this include the use of Majungatholus instead of Majungasaurus, the incorrect depiction of abelosaurid arms, the use of the potentially invalid Nanotyrannus despite many consultants discouraging its inclusion, giving Dromaeosaurids little to no feathers, making Allosaurus and Brigmaphysetter too big, giving Pachyrhinosaurus a horn, depicting Dromaeosaurus in Hell Creek, and possibly more. I really hope I don't have to explain why deliberately misinforming people in any topic, let alone dinosaurs, is wrong. You know, I, I've spent all this time saying that Jurassic Fight Club sucks because it's inaccurate, and while that is true, I think there's a lot more to it than just the inaccuracies. It's how this show is put together. The way the episodes are structured, the narrator's voice, the soundtrack are all very uncharacteristic of a documentary series. There's also all the behind the scenes drama with all kinds of horror stories about respected paleontologists like Thomas Holtz Jr., Larry Whitmer, and Phil Curry who were brought on as consultants only to have their suggestions completely ignored because the higher-ups thought they knew better than people who've literally dedicated their lives to studying these animals. It seems a little more like something you would expect from a Jurassic Park movie, not a documentary airing on the fucking History Channel. Then again, I guess this is what happens when you give a dino documentary to the people that would later make fucking ancient aliens. There's also George Blazing who really isn't very qualified for a project like this. The show credits him as a quote-unquote paleontology expert, 
which is really just a fancy way around saying that he doesn't actually have a, have a degree and isn't a real paleontologist. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. Hell, I'm not a paleontologist either, yet I still make these videos. However, George really isn't much more than a strangely successful fanboy who makes a living talking to elementary kids about how cool dinosaurs are. Thus, putting him in charge of a dinosaur documentary is more the equivalent of Disney letting some random fanboy with no filmmaking experience make their own official Star Wars movie. A project like this needed to be in the hands of professionals, but instead, history handed it over to the awesome bro fanboys. Jurassic Fight Club had potential but any attempt to make this show educational was thrown away in favor of making what's essentially a train wreck on every level. Now, I'm not trying to say that George absolutely sucks just because he doesn't have a degree. The problem is that the show doesn't give any indication that George is any different from the scientists he interviews. As such, it's easier for people watching that don't know any better to just buy everything he says without looking it up, because despite the vast web of resources called the internet, most people don't bother to do the slightest bit of research to check and see if the loud man talking to them is a actually has any credibility. Again, it's just like ancient aliens. People just believe everything the quote-unquote experts on the show blindly without checking to see if they even know what the fuck they're talking about. This is precisely the reason why I list my sources in the description of all my videos, so that people can check and see if what I am saying is credible, and if I miss something they can then inform me. It's encouraging people to do their own research rather than just blindly accepting everything I say just in case I make an error. Admittedly, it is possible that this wasn't George's fault, and from what I've heard, he actually is a pretty nice guy. After all, he actually admitted that he would actively avoid forcing paleontologists to talk about theories they didn't support, and that the reason he's the one talking about the more speculative elements is to protect the expert's reputation from backlash from the community. Like I said, a pretty nice guy. Still, I think that there is ultimately one big flaw that sums up exactly why this show failed so terribly. This flaw essentially boils down to one simple question. Who is this show intended for? Who is the show's audience? People who want to learn about dinosaurs? Probably not, given how this series is barely educational children who just want to watch dinosaurs fight? I sure hope not, since this show is full of blood and gore, and most of the kills involve either youngsters being murdered or poor helpless animals being eaten alive. Teenage edgelords? Sure, they may like the gore, but they probably won't pay attention to the educational bits and just skip to the fight. It really just seems like the producers tried to make this show appeal to everyone, but ended up with a show that tr that struggles to be appealing at all. Now, don't be mistaken, I used to love this show, but that was back when I loved dinosaurs for the same reason that most children like dinosaurs. Because they're scary, because they're awesome, because they're big. But now, I just look at this show and realize that this could have been so much more. I'll talk about this a lot more in detail in another video, and give some input as to how I would improve this show. But Jurassic Fight Club really should have taken a more educational approach, been much less about the fights and more about learning about the animals involved. And unfortunately, as much as he seems like a nice guy, I'm afraid that a lot of the blame here can be directed at George Blazing. This was his pet project, and while he likely didn't have complete control, his views on dinosaurs are embodied in this show. He's the one saying the more inaccurate things regarding animals he clearly doesn't know a whole lot about, and he talks about the fights as if each scenario he's presenting is the only possible way it could have happened, leaving very little left for alternative interpretations. 
George could have used this show to teach people about dinosaurs and how they lived, or how we know what we do about dinosaurs, but he didn't. Instead, he used it to show prehistoric monsters fighting each other, giving people the impression that animals can only be interesting when they're violently killing each other. It's like that god-awful Animal Planet show Animal Face-Off. Each episode only serves to show which animal was better. And that, unfortunately, is what happens when you let an awesome bro fanboy make a show about dinosaurs. Because George, like everyone else making this show, saw dinosaurs as nothing more than bloodthirsty monsters that spent all day killing each other and ignored the paleontologists they hired because it turns out the only reason they were even brought on in the first place was to make this gore fest seem more credible. Dinosaurs were, and still are, amazing, beautiful animals that were among the most diverse and successful creatures to ever walk the earth, and they deserve so much more respect than this. It is that lack of respect that I believe is the true reason why Jurassic Fight Club is such a failure in so many ways. Before I conclude this video, I just want to make it clear. If you like Jurassic Fight Club, that is completely fine with me. I'm not saying you can't like Jurassic Fight Club. I'm simply saying that I do not and find it difficult to see why others could like it too. But that doesn't mean you can't like it. Maybe you like that it's bad. Maybe it's one of those so bad it's good things. Maybe you just like the action. That's fine with me. Some of the, some of the fights are pretty good. The, choreo the choreography, there are good parts about it. But for me, the bad parts overshadow those. But if you don't see it that way, that is fine. You have every right to feel that way. And I am not trying to infringe on anyone's right to feel the way that they do. That's all I have for today's video, and while I'm sure there's other things I haven't addressed, I really don't want this video to be too long, and honestly I'm getting kind of tired of talking about this show. If there are some things I haven't addressed, please be sure to let me know in the comments below. Up next will be part 3 of the Natural History of Tyrannosauridia, which will consist of the possible, dubious, and unnamed Tyrannosaurids. And after that will be the creature profile of Rugops. After that, I will make a video discussing how I would fix every single episode of Jurassic Fight Club, as well as two creature profiles in another natural history, before finally moving on to the next series I will analyze, Monsters Resurrected. Thanks so much to everyone who has followed this series through to the end, and... Based on the reception that I got in my update video, I will be opening up a Discord server for people to join, so the link to that will be in the description below as well as in the comments. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already for more amazing content like this. And as always, this is PaleoNerd signing out.